This is the Trading Psychology Podcast. This is VP, creator of No Nonsense Forex and author of the book No Nonsense Forex Trading Psychology. And with me, as he is every week, it is the undisputed Rob Reinhold. Well, hello, everybody. Nice to be here and undisputed. Yes, no one with my exact name has ever beaten me up. You're right. So I am undefeated by other Rob Reinholds. Again, that's with two Bs. I did meet a Robert Reinhold. We didn't fight. We got along great. But undisputed for sure. So with this week's episode, we are continuing the uh, the VP Haters series, part two of two. We, we won't be doing this uh, any more than, than two times. Um, but this is one of the people that I don't get too often, but when I do, they are very loud. They type a lot, and um, they are quite angry sometimes. But unlike last, uh, unlike last episode where we're talking about the shortcut taker, somebody I don't have a whole lot of respect for. Uh, This person I somewhat empathize with, and that's going to be the academic. And if you don't know what I mean, you will soon. But kind of segueing into things here, Rob, you've talked about your your sports exploits in the past. You know, I'll assume you were mostly a jock growing up. uh, But did you still have any type of nerd tendencies? I know some jocks who did. I know some jocks who didn't. You know, was that in you and it did it ever manifest when you were younger or or did it take a while i was absolutely a closet nerd growing up i loved fantasy books i loved sci-fi books i loved playing dungeons and dragons but back in the day it wasn't that cool nowadays i love how the world is and for every single year i took my kids to comic-con i love comic-con and one year my son asked me dad why do you like comic-con so much and i said When I was your age, I had to hide everything. I had to hide the books I was reading inside like a notebook or I would tear the cover off so no one knew what I was reading because I would get teased and teased. Now it's cool. Now you can do all these things and it's celebrated and you have a place where you can go and totally nerd out with other people. So absolutely huge closet nerd here. And yeah, I was the same way. You know, people don't understand back uh, in the, the late 90s, I would say, there was very little crossover. You know, you were either this or you were that. With me, it wasn't Dungeons and Dragons, but it was like things like Magic the Gathering. You know, that was just starting to become a thing. And I saw people playing. I'm like, oh, what a cool looking strategy game. That would be really fun to play. But you just, you couldn't just jump ship from your group over to that group. You know, it just, it wasn't a thing like it was today, unfortunately. But yeah, that was always in me. And then later I, I, Learn to love games like uh, like Elder Scrolls and things like that, and uh, yeah, it's always been in me too. And remember, you know, I've said this before on the show, Rob. You know, I was the smart kid growing up. That was my identity. That was my only superlative. You know, I, I wasn't uh, the super athletic kid or the tall kid or the funny kid or you know the the bad kid, whatever it was that people would center that their identities around. I was the smart kid, so I always felt like the more I knew the better off I was. And I carried this over to a lot of things. If I was really interested in it, I wanted to know as much as possible. And so I would do deep research and read books and do everything I could on a particular topic. Really, not because I was going to use that information for anything constructive, but I just wanted to sound like somebody who knew what they were talking about. And I wanted to get respect and adoration for that. Uh, but in the end, it doesn't. It didn't really amount to much, and so that's kind of where I want to segue here. Um, were, were you ever like that, Rob? In any way? Before we go on, I just want to get your your take on this because I'm going to talk for a bit. I have, and you know, I want to publicly thank my mother for this because she really tried to instill love into us a love of learning, and we would always be taken to the library. We'd be taken to. We went to an opera once and we all hated it and complained. So we finally left, but she tried to like get us out there and experience things. And I just love, um, learning things. And I remember in history class, I read ahead of the class cause I wanted to know what happened in history. I wanted to know all the stuff that happened. So I would finish the book, uh, when they're still on, you know, chapter two or three, because I was just fascinated about learning. Yeah, I think fascination is better than, you know, what I was doing, just just trying to look and sound smart more than anything. But uh, so I want to, before we get into the real meat and potatoes of, uh, of the academic, I want to start with a sports betting 
analogy. Uh, people here know that I, I spent some time in the sports betting world, and got to know those people. Almost all of those people are either troubled or just not very smart in general or just just have really bad, addictive personalities. It's not a great place to be. You don't want to hang out with that crowd for too long. Um, but there are people that I had met along the way that know everything about not just the particular sport they bet on, but almost every sport out there. And I was this way too for a while, Rob. I love sports, especially football. And there was a time where I could probably name 90 to 95% of the starting lineups in the NFL for that year. I was that much into it. And these people are too. And they thought, or that they probably still think, that this level of knowledge helps them in the sports betting world because why wouldn't it? You know, the more you know about something, the better off you're probably going to be. Problem is, none of these guys won at any higher of a clip than just your average better did. You know, they all lost just like everybody else. So they spent all this time learning all these things and all these people and staying up to date on all these things injuries, stuff like that, and it just didn't matter. And I thought that was strange. And I looked around and I, I found that the small handful of professional bettors, like actual pros, who did win, and they all had something in common, and I want your take on this, Rob, when I'm done. The people who actually won at sports betting, like all, all five of them, they all had something in common. They barely knew anything about sports, at least in terms of like who was on what team and things like that. But they understood betting markets and they just focused in on that. They would never stick around and watch the games. They would come in, do what they had to do, leave, and then you would see them the next day cashing their tickets. And I've come to find out that this was the case. This is still the case now. The people who are really good at this barely even focus on the particulars. Which is weird because a lot of people who sell their betting picks, they know everything about everything because they want you, the customer, to think that they know this game inside and out. Therefore, they're going to win more than your average person. And almost none of them do. It's pretty fascinating. Can you can you figure out why this might be, Rob? Because this this seems to be the case across the board. Oh, I just got a grin on my face because like you were hitting so many good points and I've, I've forgotten all the things I wanted to say, but absolutely. And what you said is the people that are good at winning the games of gambling, they're good at the gambling part. They're not good at the football part. So when you think about it, when you're trying to win, um, let's say you do a three game parlay and it's, it's NFL and you're trying to decide, okay, what teams are going to win? you are looking at it at like the second level of the problem. You're looking at the second level of the problem, like, oh, I, I like the Steelers, but the Steelers have a running back that's out this week, so I'm going to go with the Dolphins. You're, you're really not even looking at the actual bet. And other people, they're looking at the bet, and they don't care about the team. They don't care about the running back. They're looking at what is the best way for me to win this bet. And that's how they approach it. And when they approach it like that, they get rid of a lot of the junk and you don't need to know all the stuff. And now you're just talking about statistics and probabilities. And I see this in trading all the time, all the time. And one of my favorite stories, and I've told this on your podcast a couple of times, but I'm going to tell it again because I love this story so much. My, me and uh, Joe, who I've been trading with Joe for like 23 years now. And it was early on and I was arguing with Joe and I said, Joe, and I pounded my fist and I said, I know I'm right. And he looked at me like I was crazy. And he says, I don't want to be right. I just want to make some money. And I just sat there and thought, he's right. I'm looking at the sports teams. I'm looking at the running backs. He's looking at the bet. And how can he win that bet? That's absolutely how you're going to win in the world of the stock market and Forex. You could know everything about the Bank of Japan. You could know the name of the uh, central bankers. It doesn't matter. Do you know how to win the bet? And that's the perfect segue into what we're talking about 
today. And this is going to come off as really good news to some people and very, very bad news to other people. <laughs> uh, but just like you said, Rob, more knowledge about something like sports betting or something like trading does not equal more money. We all think it does early on. You know, I used to get the question a lot. You know, do you recommend any books on forex trading? Because uh, I want to, I want to go ahead and get started and read and learn as much as I can right now. And I, it's, I almost didn't know how to answer it because I, I knew where these people were going. They were completionists. They, they thought that if they, that what we just talked about, if I know more about something, the better chance I have to do well in it. Which for some things is the case. But for things where you're making bets or making a gamble of sorts, and I hate to call trading that, but it, there are parallels, it does not compute. You knowing, like you said, about all the chairs of the Fed or the ECB or the history behind the Japanese yen or all the tech behind Ethereum, it does absolutely nothing for your trading. And I'll even go so far as to argue that it probably takes away from it. Would you say that's true or false long term? A hundred percent. A hundred percent true. And this is where I had to go through this process because, you know, I loved learning. So I learned everything I could. I would listen to the earnings reports. I mean, the earnings calls that the companies would have after and they'd learn about the CEO. Hey, that CEF, that CFO sounded like better guy than the CEO. And, and then I would go out and let that determine some part of my trading aspect because their CEO, CFO, who I think was a cool guy, said this. It, it's not even about the game anymore. Again, you got to bet on the actual game itself. Right, let me keep going here because I want to go. I want to go into a DraftKings thing that once they made uh, sports betting legal, people came in and wrote algorithms. And you just, you can't even win at like fantasy football anymore because the people that are going in there, they're not even looking at players. A couple of years ago, I was reading an article about DraftKings. So in the United States, they made sports betting legal for the first time across the country. And so you could go onto DraftKings and bet on fantasy football and you could put together a fantasy football team. Very quickly, once there was a financial reward, People went in there and started playing the game, not because they love football, but because they wanted the financial reward. They were looking at this is how do I win the bet? How do I win this pool in the fantasy football league at DraftKings? Not how do I put together the best team? Not what running back is best? So they would look over here and be like, okay, we need to pick a tight end that's playing against the Packers this week. So they would go out and pick a Tight end was playing against the Packers that no one liked, that no one knew about, but they knew that the Packers can't guard the tight end. Anyway, they started looking at the data and they started making teams based on algorithms and data. And now they pretty much rule DraftKings. That's how you play it. Because again, they're focused on winning the game, not in the all the things around the game. So you mean to tell me, that simply by coming in and creating a dumb algorithm that doesn't even really think, it just takes the data in front of it and uses it to its advantage, that that was way better than anybody doing anything else, literally. Well, even more specifically, um, they built the algorithm, but the algorithm was built to win. And so when you read about what they're doing, they'll join like 20 leagues, fully knowing that they're going to win three out of the 20 leagues. So it, it's not even about like the data putting together. It's, it's this master plan of, hey, we're going to put out $5,000 this week and we have a high probability of getting back $7,000 this week. And then just one more story and then we got to go on. I actually watched a guy on TikTok where he made a bet on the underdog in every single game in the NCAA March Madness Tournament. So it's a basketball tournament every March. And he made the underdog bet. And by the end of the tournament, he had won a substantial amount of money. Um, now, of course, every year that's going to be different. Years where there's more upsets, you're going to have more of an upside. But do you see how he didn't even care about 
the basketball. He didn't even care about anything. He said, hey, let me see if I can get an edge over here. He found out he can get an edge. And then that's what he ran with. It's, it's about winning. It's not about anything else. So that's perfect. Now take this into the trading market. You know, just like I segued this, you know, you're, you're providing a, you know, kind of a deeper level of information than I did. When we take this into trading, where does the same uh, methodology come into play? One of my favorite things to tell traders, and I love when every trader gets to this point. Every trader goes, comes in through that front door, they, they read a bunch of books, gather a bunch of information, they go out and try it, and you know they, they make a little bit of money first, and then they lose it, and then they gotta figure out what to do. And at some point, it no longer is about the money. And now, it's this intellectual pursuit of how do I win this game? We have a market that is random. I, I say it's a huge wild animal. We have no control over it. No one has any control over it. It's gonna do weird things. It's gonna do whatever it wants. How do we, this little tiny speck, how do we go in and win this game? And that's where everything you talk about, Patrick, building a system, back testing it, testing it out, going through it and making sure it is rigorous and then going to put it into play, make adjustments to it. I mean, as you can see, that's about winning the game. And this is where all the way back, and I can't remember what episode it was, but at one of the beginnings, you asked me the question, how long do I think people should demo trade? And my answer was never, zero. Because the only way to learn it is to get in the game. Get in the game, get some bumps and bruises, figure out how to not get bumps and bruises anymore and go on. And that's the problem with the academic is they don't want to get in the game and get bumps and bruises. Yeah. And uh, I don't remember what episode that was, but um, spoiler alert, I disagreed with Rob on the amount of time you should be demo trading if you didn't already know, but that's, yeah, that's a different story for a different time, but you're exactly right though, Rob. Uh, the academic would rather just learn a bunch about it and read books and go to seminars and watch these uh, watch these high profile financial people speak, because at the end of the day, like you said, you have to go in and do it. And something tells me that the academic doesn't do a lot of doing; they do a lot of learning and a lot of talking and a lot of pontificating, which is what I did back in the day, because I thought for some reason that would end up getting me somewhere. And I had to learn over time that it got me absolutely nowhere. I had to do two things. One, well, three really. One, get rid of all that excess knowledge that wasn't only not getting me anywhere, but it was really getting in my way and promoting analysis paralysis in a lot of my trades. Two, I had to simplify everything and distill it down into simply trading the market. This took me way too long to figure out, and that is why I am sitting here on a dedicated episode saying this to everybody else, because I have a feeling that a lot of you are like me or like Rob. And then three, what the hell was three? I just had to simply ap apply it. You just have to get up and do the work and test over and over. But none of these things are gonna happen unless you eliminate that useless information first. So yeah, to, to where this comes full circle when it comes to the people who comment on my channel. And it's funny, like they'll come in and I'll generally ignore them and then they'll just go away. But what they will say is, how can you tell people this VP and not tell them all of this? In order to really become a successful trader, you need to know about the mathematics behind this indicator. The indicator people are the worst. You know, you need to understand the full works of Larry Williams. You know, I, I went and saw Larry Williams talk in uh, in in Sydney and in Hong Kong and in Boston. You know, so therefore, you know, what you need to do, VP, is you need to to run your channel the way I would run your channel, which I think we're kind of cutting to the meat of the problem, right there. I think because these problems have such a hard time executing, and I actually executed, that they wish it would have been them getting the attention 
and getting the respect for knowing something about something. But they don't because, one, they went the wrong direction. They went the deep academic knowledge direction and not the executing direction. And this isn't me beating my chest. This is saying, hey, if you if this might hit some of you in a certain spot, <laughs> understand there's two directions you can go here. One of them gets you absolutely nowhere. We all thought it was going to get us somewhere, but it doesn't. It's actually eliminating most of that and simply going the more dumb dumb route and just simply pulling the trigger. And these people, the academic, first of all, academics, like who hires academics? They're not very useful for anything. Um, two, it upsets them so much that I don't run my channel the way they would have run my channel that they think I'm doing the world a disservice by not taking them down this path, which leads absolutely nowhere. My first couple years of trading were in the late 90s. And the late 90s, um, 97, 98 was pretty good. And then 99, somewhere about midway through the middle of 99, things went bonkers. Things went absolutely bubblicious. I mean, crazy. Kind of like what we saw after COVID. Even worse, though. It was even worse. That's where you had, you know, dot-com stocks going from $20 up to $400 in just a couple of months. And at the time, I was reading, I was learning all this stuff, and I looked at the lemmings, literally called them lemmings, looked at the idiots, called them idiots, that were bullish in 1999. And I thought to myself, I am not a lemming. I am not an idiot. I am smart. I am well read. I know things. I read a book about bubbles, and this is exactly what they look like. And with smugness, I sat there while everyone else made a ton of money. And I sat there not participating in it, but the whole time thinking, yeah, but I'm going to look back on this and say I wasn't a dummy, so I'm okay with it. And then the bubble did pop. And when the bubble popped, oh my gosh, that smugness was tenfold. I was so smug. And then I went short the market and I made a lot of money. And oh my gosh, I was so smug about how much I knew. And then the market bottomed out in 2002. And for the next three to, three to four years, I was a perma bear. I only liked the bearish side. I could only look at things as a pessimist. And the market ran and ran and ran. And everyone else was making money, but I was fighting it. I was constantly either shorting it or staying out of it or saying, I've got chasing it. It's too crazy. That hurt me for those couple of years. And those years were pretty lean years as a trader. And it was all because of me setting myself up as, quote, not an idiot, quote, not a lemming, not going to jump off the cliff with everyone else. And it took me a lot of time to really look inside myself and be like, hey, what are you concerned about? Being right and being smug or making money? And I finally realized this was something I had to get over. I had to get over. And it was making me angry when I looked at all the other people that were just going long and making a bunch of money. And here's me being very disciplined. I looked down on them with disdain. And this brings up to mind one of my favorite Saturday Night Live videos. And this video is almost impossible to find online. Something must have happened um, where it got banned somewhere or something. But I found a link, Patrick. I will send it to you so you can link it to this video on YouTube. But it's, it's a March Madness thing again, going back to March Madness. They had two people with the highest scores. And one was this sports writer who knew all this stuff, knew every single player, knew their, their ankle hurt, knew everything. And then on the other side was like a college freshman girl who made the bets based on the mascots and about her ex-boyfriends. And she was beating Peyton Manning. And he was so upset about it. And that just reminded me of, oh my gosh, that's, that's how I was. I was looking at all these, quote, college freshmen who were, didn't know anything and were making all this money in the market. And I was so upset about it. And I realized that's only hurting me. 
And so I worked really hard on um, unbecoming a perma bear. And I told myself, the next bubble that forms, I'm going to get filthy rich off it. And now I love bubbles. Oh my gosh, bubbles are the best. There's nothing better than being in a bubble. You just have to understand that at some point it's going to end. As long as you understand that, jump in the bubble. It's so much fun. Yeah, the early part of what you were talking about pretty much describes me on my investing podcast. But caveat emptor, I will say that uh, we do understand the market is going to turn up where you certainly want to be part of a bull market because they are long and they run for a long, they run a lot. Uh, so yeah, we are we're relishing the day where we can switch our bearish focus. But I, I know what you're saying. Yeah, you, you think you're one thing and you think that one thing makes you really smart when at the end of the day, it, it's just doing you absolutely no service. Not only a service, it is absolutely harming you to have that attitude. Yeah, exactly. Um, because not only is it taking you away from wins, it's probably causing losses as well. It's hitting you from both ends. So before we get to the solution here, Rob, you know, because you're the one who always kind of pays attention to what's going on in people's brains and why these things might happen, you're much better at this than I am. What do you think is causing these academics to not only be the way they are even later into life after they already kind of know it's not really working out and why don't they want to make the change and why are they still so steel heavy into this mentality? I think it's because they don't really understand the game. You know, they were told that if you know about charting, if you know about the Williams oscillator, if you know about all this stuff, you're going to win. And if you don't know it, you're going to lose. And it's just like telling someone, hey, if you want to win at fantasy football, you got to know about running backs. You got to know about wide receivers. Look, we, when I got into it, I, I didn't really look at it as a, an engineering problem. I looked at it as an intellectual problem. And, and so I think that's the problem is that people are looking at, they, they're looking at all these ancillary things that they think are going to cause them to win and ignoring what actually causes you to win. Being on the side where there's more buyers and sellers during your trade. If you're long, that's how you win a long trade. Now look, you can look at things to try to tell you, hey, what is the buying and selling pressure on this currency or on the stock or whatever. But in the end, the only reason you make money if you go long is because during your trade, there was more buyers than sellers in a net amount. And if you go short, the only reason you made money was that there was more people selling than buying during your time frame. That's it. That's the real game you're trying to play. The problem is we're not looking at that game. We're looking at all the ancillary things because that's what we've been told. And they're, they're easier to look at sometimes and learn. But when it comes right down to it, that's how you win this game. And if you focus on how do I win this game? How do I, how do I win the game where I'm in long trades when there's more buyers and sellers and I'm in short trades when there's more sellers or buyers? Do you see how a lot of the things that you think about don't even matter? Like, does the Bank of Japan and who is the head of the Bank of Japan even matter when you're trying to win that game? It doesn't. Focus on what you're really trying to accomplish. And that's being on the right side of trades during supply and demand imbalances. And that's a perfect segue into the, the first point of the overall solution. It's just understand trading is actually very simple. If you choose to complicate it in any way, it's not only not going to benefit you, it is probably going to work against you. But it's weird because we have been conditioned to not think this way. Like we said at the top of the show, we feel we always felt like the more you know about something, the better you're going to be. If I go to these financial conventions, I can probably get a bunch of takeaways that I can apply in my trading. Truth is, Rob, and we've both been to these conventions, these unless you're glad handing or trying to network or you just want some time away from your boring life or a, a spouse you hate or whatever the case is, these financial conventions really don't serve any purpose at all, do they? No, and you're exactly right. Um, I, I go to them periodically. I haven't been to one since before COVID, but I always just saw it as a, as a write-off vacation. That's why I went. 
hey, let me go, let me go on vacation and write it off for business. Yeah, so you have all these things going on around you that you think smart people go to because they're smart and they're good at what they do. And uh, this is how they accumulate more knowledge. Completely the opposite of what you need to be focusing on. So I guess the point is don't allow all these things to misdirect you because that is what they're going to do at the end of the day. More knowledge does not equal better trading. Now, Rob, you have such a great sample size in front of you and you've gotten to know a lot of your traders. Apart from me, who is a uh, who's a God level super genius, do you have anybody in your pack of traders who is just one of these people that is super analytical and knows all this about the trading markets? Or have you pretty much conditioned that out of just about everybody who works for you because you simply have no other choice but to do that? We have really smart people at Maverick Trading, and I'm not going to downplay that. But let me just tell you that I have instructed our recruiters to pass on people who are, quote, know-it-alls, just to pass on them, and to take people that are going to be good at following rules. I, if I can train someone to put in rules and follow them and follow them to a T, they'll always beat the intellectual that knows every little single thing about options theory every time. Give me someone that knows how to be disciplined and can stay consistent and put in the work year over year after year. That's who we want. And I instruct my recruiters, pass on the know-it-alls. Let's get humble people that are hungry to work and can be disciplined. Now, I do want to extend an olive branch here and say there's one distinction I do want to make. Um, so don't be an academic in any way, shape, or form. But I feel like, Rob, it's okay to be an enthusiast if, and a big if here, if you were able to separate the enthusiasm from the trading. You might like this, everything that's going on in the financial world. You know, this might be something that stimulates you. This might be something that, you know, you really want to know more about. And uh, not, not, not for pontification reasons, but just simply because it drives you and it fascinates you. And there's it, it, far be it for me to ever tell somebody that they should avoid something that they really, really enjoy. Um, but you have to draw the line somewhere. Um, and I don't, I don't want to pick on him, but we have a, a really good, consistent YouTube commenter um, who, who writes a lot. And it's, it's full of substance. It's not full of fluff. He writes a lot of really, really good, intelligent, well thought out things. I do find myself every once in a while I'll come in and say, hey, you know, just so you know, <laughs> you know, don't get too deep in the weeds here. It is not benefiting you the way you probably think. I was just like you. And that's why I empathize with these people, Rob, because I was there myself. And I had to learn the hard way because I had absolutely nobody telling me otherwise that you really do have to either draw a line or just get rid of all that fluff in the first place. Patrick, I know that you are well acquainted with our saying at Maverick, uh, but I you love to use it. It's cocktail talk. Like I love to learn about stuff. I, I know I do know all the central bank governors. I do know all the things about their children's stuff. I love it. And we'll talk about that a lot at Maverick. We'll, we'll talk about that in videos. We'll t talk about that in live sessions. We'll talk about it, you know, just face to face. But we have a saying that that's cocktail talk, meaning that's best done when you have a drink in your hand, drinking with your buddies, and you're talking about this kind of stuff. It's cocktail talk. It's fun. It's great. But there's nothing in cocktail talk that should make you change or determine a trading decision. That should always be based on your system that you've back tested. period. Cocktail talk is fun. I love it. I, Patrick, I mean, look, how many... Like we shoot these, we shoot, it ends up being two hours because we have cocktail talk about the markets for about an hour of it because we love to do it. It's fun. Allow yourself to do it. Just don't allow it to get into your trading. And I will say, you know, my experience might differ from yours, but at the end of the day, the handful of traders I've gotten to know fairly well who do pretty well at this market, they are not gigabrained people. They're actually kind of derpy <laughs> at the end of the day, but you know, it's, it's almost like that, that midwit bell curve that you see. You see the really dumb, you know, guy eating paste 
on the left side, and then you see you know the the 200 IQ guy on the right side, and they're both thinking the same thing, and that one thing is very very raw and very simple to where the the midwit, the guy at the top of the bell curve, is just overthinking everything. You know, if you need a visual to go along with this episode, you know, let it be that. You know, Rob, do you have anything to say before we sign off here? No, I just want to circle back to cocktail talk. Uh, again, we've been using this term for so many years at Maverick. It's fun. It's fun. It, go out and learn all you want. Just understand it's for cocktails. It's not for trading. Trading is about engineering and making a system that works. Cocktail talk is, is shooting the shit with your friends and having some fun and you know, talking about stuff that's interesting to you, like the Bank of Japan. Like I love when I can talk to someone about the, about the Bank of Japan. Does that influence my yen trades? Absolutely not. Keep them separate. Yeah. And so next time I see you, Rob, we'll have some cocktail talk and we'll raise a glass to a Shinzo Abe for making yen pairs great again uh, for a very, very long time up until, his, uh, up until his unfortunate death. And on that note, traders, thank you for joining us here on the Trading Psychology Podcast. Rob and I will both see you next week. Goodbye, everybody.